Hi everyone, welcome to Kings and Queens Chess Academy's YouTube channel. I'm Grandmaster Magesh Panchanathan and today you're going to be looking at Paul Murphy's game series. We have been exploring a few games with Paul Murphy, one of my favorite players. He has so many great things about him. He was extremely talented, way ahead of his time and the ease with which he was playing and destroying his opponents was just, you know, amazing. And he has played some fantastic model games, which I think are excellent learning material for, for the beginner level players, particularly when you're starting. Uh, let's say you know all the basic rules of the game and you've learned that. And now you're focusing on basic strategies. I would say um, once you have the rules and captures figured out, Paul Murphy would be a fantastic place to start to go after that, right? And of course, it's also very useful for even higher level players. After that, he has some amazing combinations to look at. Today we're going to be looking at the fried liver attack, the infamous fried liver attack, very, very popular among young kids, um, particularly who are aggressive. And you don't have to really specifically say that, I guess, because most of these kids want to just checkmate you right there um, as soon as the game starts, right? Like they don't want to play like 60 move game. So fried liver attack adds a great value uh, because it's extremely aggressive. And if you're not sure what this opening is, you're going to learn that today when we go through this particular game. And one more thing before we start the game is that Paul Murphy was actually playing rook cards in this game, meaning he was down a rook from move one. And that is pretty impressive because he has done this a lot during his time. And you can kind of see why in this game. Murphy was so good that he was getting bored playing regular games. So he had to give odds to most of the players to make the game like an even match. And um, again, in this game, you would notice that even giving a rook sometimes did not make the game such an even match, right? Let's see what happened in this game. So e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, the Italian opening, knight f6. So usually black has two possible moves here, uh, two main moves, I would say. You can develop the knight or develop the bishop. Makes sense because I want to develop both these pieces. Just try to castle, yeah? Castling is the most important thing I want to do in the beginning of the game to keep my king safe. So knight f6 runs into some you know, tricky openings. If you're going to play knight f6, you just better know what you're doing. That's the only thing I would say right now. Um, initially, maybe it's recommended to start with bishop c5, so you don't have to deal with this move. And uh, why does knight f6 play any role in that? Because the queen would have been able to capture that knight, if not for your knight on f6, right? So Murphy plays knight g5, and clearly that's a problem here. And the only defensive move usually is d5. So pawn captures, knight captures, and this is the starting of the fried liver attack. So what happens here is uh, white launches a sacrifice. So Morphe starts with knight captures f7. Looks like a bad move because the knight has no protection. But you can see the follow-up. Let's see if you can pause really quickly and try to find the follow-up. Hopefully you found the follow-up check that is queen to f3 check. And this is a nice check because it's a basic double attack. And it's giving your opponent one very dangerous option. Uh, the black king can go back to e8, definitely not to g8, that will mean that the king is just still in the diagonal for the bishop. Um, I can go back to e8, but I would lose the knight, right? And I can try to block the check, but then I would still lose the knight. Right? The only way to save this knight is to take a step forward. And that, of course, is very scary, right? Because if you want to bring your king up like that. And in the game, black decides to do that. In fact, that happens to be the best move. It's not a bad move for black. Particularly without this rook, black is still completely winning, right? Um, I mean, white's down a rook after all. <laughs> okay, so king e6, and there's a nice pin on this knight. So the usual follow-up is you attack the pinned piece. So Murphy plays knight to c3, makes a lot of sense. Lots of pressure on this knight. And there are a couple of ways to defend it. You could either go knight to b4 or knight to e7, two of these options. Black chooses the safe one, which is knight to e7. And I usually don't like defending from um, my opponent's zone like this because there's always a problem of, uh, you know, getting kicked out. So knight to e7, safer option, right? Now here, I, I really like this game. This is very common. I Some of these things are very common ideas, but I still like how Morphe approaches this, right? White is down a rook and down a piece. So white started down a rook from the beginning of the game. White also gave up the knight on f7, right? So the good thing is the king is on e6 for black, which really could be a nice target for white. But other than that, white is down a lot of material, right? So how do you play in a situation like this? You have to play extremely aggressive, right? You have to create threats after threats after threats. The only reason you're winning, or even, I mean, I wouldn't say winning, 
The only reason black is struggling or white has a real chance is because these pieces have not been developed. Now, if you don't play with a purpose, we don't play fast attacking your opponent, black will get the time to develop those pieces. So let's see what Morphe does. Castle, right? Don't forget developing your own pieces, right? And I've talked about this in the Morphe series. The best thing about Paul Morphe is that he loved to attack, but his aggression was always coordinated. He had his pieces together, right? That's the fun. If you just send one soldier attacking, uh, I mean, walking into your opponent's ter territory trying to attack, it's not so much fun. Uh, the soldier will get slaughtered, right? But in this case, he brings all his pieces. And you will see that in most of his games. His deadly attacks are because all of his pieces combine together. Pawn to c6 makes a lot of sense because I want to reinforce this one. Now, the next move, d5. A very strong move, again. Um, not necessarily winning or anything, but I really like the purpose with which white's opening up the center, right? If you think about it, Morphe could have easily played d3. Yeah, that's definitely opening the bishop. Why not? Yeah, that's going to get the bishop out. Uh, maybe f4 to maybe g5, maybe rook d1. There are lots of simple moves. But even there, Morphe wants to play it more forcing, right? Create pressure somewhere. Always keep your opponent on their toes. They, they need to figure out something because you're always creating threats. That was the beautiful ideas of Paul Morphe, yeah? After pawn captures, you might be able to guess the king is out in the open. So definitely... We need to attack it. Rook e1 check was played. And the king went to d7. So at this point, black is completely better and black is winning. I'm going to show you where black really made a huge blunder and lost. So knight captures d5 was played. And you can see that this knight is being attacked by three pieces. Knight, bishop and queen. And it's only defended by two of them. So you could definitely win material. But the thing is, white's already down a rook and a knight. So winning a pawn here is not going to make the biggest difference. However, it's still going to remove a bunch of pieces that's surrounding this king for black. So that's going to help us attack the king, yeah? So Morphe plays knight captures, knight captures, bishop captures, and now black makes the biggest mistake of playing pawn captures d5. I think there's no reason to take that bishop. Simply playing queen f6 here, offering a queen trade, and this king will find some place in with the bishop getting out. Um, black should consolidate and be winning because, again, black is up a lot of material needed to defend, right? Um, but let's see what happened in the game. Black took that pawn. I think you can guess Morphe's next move. Pretty straightforward. Queen captures pawn check. And again, black still has a chance to survive this if he had blocked the check with bishop to d6, which I would say is the most natural move. Um, Black probably had a calculation error here when they played king to c7. I would pass really quick, try to find a forcing checkmate for white. It's probably um, one, two, three, four moves. But they're all checks. All right, hopefully you figured it out. Yes, the starting moves bishop to c4 check. That's not so difficult to find out. But here's the next move that you need to find. After bishop goes to d6, what did Paul Murphy play? Hopefully you figured out the move. The beautiful queen c5 check. What are we doing? We are making use of this pin and sending the king back. Now the king has two squares to d7 or b8. Unfortunately, both of them lead to checkmate for black. He went to b8 and if he had gone to d7, that would be a checkmate. So he went to b8 and then Morphe, of course, wanted to checkmate with his bishop. So he takes queen takes d6 check, queen takes and bishop takes d6. A beautiful checkmate. Look at that king being smothered on his own area, right? White used every single piece. Again, the biggest emphasis I want to make in the Paul Murphy series, development, coordination of pieces, being aggression, using a lot of tempo, right? So you have to kind of use all of these things together. All right, I hope you enjoyed the game. Thank you.